see. And he's here tonight with his wife, Mona. Where's Mona? <laughs> um, and uh, Josh is an uh, advocacy director for the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation. And as such, uh, oh, in the U.S. campaign, what it is is a coalition of over 400 local activist groups around the country whose uh, goal is to change U.S. policy toward Israel and Palestine. And what kind of change that would be would be to stop any aid that supports the Israeli occupation and to redirect our, our aid or our attention to uh, securing the human rights and, and international law uh, in Palestine and Israel, which would mean equality for all people. And Josh, um, as most of you know, because you were upstairs, he just published this book, Shattered Hope, Obama's Failure to Broker an Israeli-Palestinian Peace. And he brings uh, to this uh, book and to us tonight uh, experience as an activist and um, uh, as a, someone who's worked in government. Um, initially, he ran for uh, office in Virginia um, on the Green Party, a, a, local, a local election. Um, and while he didn't win the elections, he did manage to bring the issues, especially issues about of low, uh, lack of low-income housing, to public awareness by, by running by his candidacy. And uh, after that, or maybe simultaneously, uh, he worked for the Congressional Research Service. Um, this is a, a nonpartisan governmental agency that supplies analysis to members of Congress. And as you can imagine, Josh's area of expertise was the Middle East. Um, he went on to found and direct an uh, organization called Jews for Peace in Palestine and Israel, uh, which later merged with Jewish Voice for Peace, which many of you may know of because it is a very active, vibrant uh, organization which, uh, again, tries to change U.S. policy at, uh, and uh, to protest uh, uh, the abuses uh, that, I that Israel's occupation brings to the Palestinian people. Um, Josh has a graduate degree in international affairs from John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. And he has authored uh, articles and been um, uh, on the air with uh, ABC, NBC, C-SPAN, um, Al Jazeera, and he's written for USA Today, Los Angeles Times, and many more. So um, he's uh, been very um, prolific in his uh, ways and um, the amount of time he's spent trying to work to change policies which he's found to be unjust. So with that, I'd like to, well, tonight, tonight he's going to talk in, in sort of two segments uh, about the peace, pro the peace process, which seems to have completely collapsed, and um, gives some, maybe half of his time to that, and the other half of the time to this thorny question we always have, which is, what can we do about it? And uh, we'll be talking about the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign, um, which is front and center of what we can do about it. So thank you, Josh. And uh, I want to thank the Kairos Palestine group for inviting me here to this beautiful, lovely town of Ashfield. And thanks to the First Congregational Church for hosting this gathering tonight and thank you as well to all of you uh, who have gathered here tonight to talk about a very important issue which is the way in which our country relates to the Israeli-Palestinian issue and what we can do as concerned citizens to bring about the change that will be necessary to finally establish a just and lasting peace between Palestinians and Israelis, something that continues to elude our government, which seems perpetually clueless about how to proceed with this so-called peace process that Cheryl mentioned. 
Now, for those of you who have been following the news, you know that this past Tuesday was an earth-shattering, momentous, historic occasion in the history of this so-called peace process. Because nine months ago, when the Secretary of State, John Kerry, recommenced Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, he declared that it was his goal that by April 29th, 2014, we would have a full-blown peace treaty between Israel and the Palestinians. And indeed, John Kerry and President Barack Obama and his entire foreign policy team tried to convince us that this time around it was going to be different. That this time around the parties were serious and that the United States was serious about brokering a deal. But as these negotiations progressed, we saw the State Department begin to scale back its expectations for these negotiations. So that by the fall of last year, after these negotiations had only been going on for just a few months, already it was quite clear that Israel and the Palestinians had hit a wall in these talks. And in fact, there's actually no proof whatsoever that Israel and the Palestinian negotiating team actually met to discuss substantive issues since October or November. That is how at loggerheads these talks have been. So when it became clear that no, we were not going to get this full-fledged peace treaty by April 29, 2014, John Kerry and the State Department began to scale back expectations. And at first they said, well, now the goal is not a full-blown peace treaty, but the writing of a, quote, framework agreement to set the parameters and the principles so that the parties can agree on how to move these negotiations forward in an unspecified period of time. Now, Israel and the Palestinians have been negotiating through this so-called peace process for more than two decades. And as the State Department is fond of saying, everybody knows in great detail exactly what the issues are. There's no need to have discussions and negotiations about signing an agreement to put in place principles to negotiate on in the future. This is what has been done for the past 20 plus years. But then when it became clear that Israel and the Palestinian negotiating team could not even agree on general principles for how to resolve their issues, the State Department began to scale back expectations further. So what we saw a few weeks ago from the Department of State was an admission that now talks are not focused on a peace treaty, not focused on a framework agreement, but these talks are focused about talking about extending the talks. <laughs> In other words, more process and no peace. A continuation of the folly of more than two decades of this U.S. so-called peace process. But when it became clear that the Palestinian negotiating team finally had enough of this charade, and that it was clear that negotiations to extend the negotiations were not even feasible, finally last week, the Department of State admitted that it was clear that Israel and the Palestinians needed a, quote, pause in these talks <laughs> and time to figure out what comes next. So why did these negotiations led by John Kerry fail just like every other previous round of Israeli-Palestinian talks and why shattered hopes Obama's failure to broker Israeli-Palestinian peace even though this was written about President Obama's policies in his first term why does the title of this book not at all make me clairvoyant? It was clear to everyone except John Kerry that these talks were bound to fail. And the reason why these talks were bound to fail was because they were premised 
on the exact same assumptions of this failed two decade plus peace process in air quotes. And the reason why U.S. negotiations to broker an Israeli-Palestinian deal have failed and will continue to fail as long as they're based on these current premises is for, I think, one very simple reason, which is that this so-called peace process is not about ending Israel's separate and unequal discriminatory policies toward the Palestinian people. And in fact, the reverse is true. This so-called peace process is about entrenching and trying to normalize and to reify Israel's apartheid control over the Palestinian people. Now, for those of you who have been following the news, Secretary of State John Kerry was meeting with something called the Trilateral Commission last Friday. I have no idea what the Trilateral Commission was, but apparently it's a big deal. And he was addressing what he thought was a closed door meeting. And he warns that because of the breakdown of these talks, Israel might in the future become an apartheid state. And this set off a huge firestorm of criticism. How dare the Secretary of State even suggest that Israel may in the future become an apartheid state? Now, as I wrote today in The Hill, which is a Capitol Hill news publication, John Kerry got it wrong in his remarks. Israel will not in the indeterminate future become an apartheid state one day, but Israel is today an apartheid state, and I would argue Israel has always been an apartheid state since, since its establishment in 1948. Now, this might be a very bitter pill for some people to swallow, but this is the reality of the situation. The international definition of apartheid is the governmental establishment of laws and institutions and regulations and so forth that privilege one set of people and discriminate against another set of people based on factors such as nationality, ethnicity, race, religion. This is what <laughs> Israel is by defining itself as a Jewish state and not as a state of all of its citizens, like every other country in the world. This would be like the United States defining ourselves as a white nation and providing lesser or no political rights to people who were not white, as we, of course, at one time did in this country. Yes, we have shared values between the United States and Israel, although in my mind, it's not the type of shared values that the US politicians are incessantly talking about. Israel's policies toward the Palestinian people for more than six decades resemble exactly what we did to the indigenous inhabitants of this country as well. And I would argue that apartheid is the correct framework for understanding Israel's policies toward the Palestinian people because when you look at this system, this structure that Israel has created to rule over the entirety of historic Palestine. It is a system that fundamentally discriminates against the Palestinian people and treats them separately and unequally because of their nationality, because of their religion. This is the definition of what apartheid is. John Kerry got it wrong. And he got it wrong because apartheid exists for all three components of the Palestinian people, whether we're talking about refugees, who were exiled from their homes in 1948 through a deliberate and systematic campaign of ethnic cleansing by Israel, which removed roughly 90% of indigenous Palestinians from their homes in what became the state of Israel. If we're talking about this Palestinian refugee population, which numbers more than 5 million today, 
we have a clear case of discrimination because Israel refuses to allow these Palestinian refugees to return to the homes and the lands from which they were expelled in 1948, despite the fact that Article 13 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that every human being has the right to leave their home or their country at any time and for any reason and to return at any time and for any reason. But Israel refuses to allow Palestinian refugees to exercise this right of return because in Israel's mind, these are not human beings with human rights, but they are a, quote, demographic threat to Israel. Because Israel maintains that it has a so-called right to continue to artificially engineer this situation in which a majority of its citizens are Jewish. The only reason why Israel exists as a state today with a majority of its citizens who are Jewish is because of this act of ethnic cleansing in 1948 and the refusal to redress it and make it right. This is the only reason why the demographic balance is this way today in Israel. Now, on the other hand, if you're a Jewish person from Massachusetts, you can pack up your bags, move to Israel tomorrow under what's called the Law of Return, claim automatic citizenship, and actually live on land that was expropriated from Palestinians ethnically cleansed in 1948. One set of laws for one people, another set of laws for another people, based on nothing more than their religion or national identity. Now, Israel often claims that it is a democracy, as someone pointed out to me uh, as an editorial in the Boston Globe, I think, from today, that Israel is a democracy because, and it's not an apartheid state, as John Kerry claims, because it grants its Palestinian citizens democratic rights. So not all Palestinians were ethnically cleansed from their homes in lands that became Israel, which, by the way, were established on 78% of historic Palestine in 1948, on the ruins of Palestinian society. In 1948, Israel demolished 531 villages, raised them to the ground, emptied 11 urban Palestinian neighborhoods of all of their inhabitants. This was the vast scale of ethnic cleansing which took place. But not all were ethnically cleansed. Some remained, and yes, they became citizens of the state of Israel, and yes, they have the right to vote. Yes, they have the right to run for Israel's parliament, known as the Knesset, and they do serve there. All of this is true. But having the right to vote, having the right to representation in a parliament is a prerequisite for democracy, but it's certainly not the be-all and end-all of what it means to have a democracy. To be a true democracy, there needs to be equality, equality under the law, all citizens treated in the same way. And is this the case for the 20% of Israel's population of citizens who are Palestinian? And I would argue no, because there are actually more than 50 laws on Israel's books that discriminate between its Palestinian citizens and its Jewish citizens. So let me give you one example. One example relates to the use of public land. Israel does not control its public land. Instead, it's turned over to a private charitable organization called the Jewish National Fund. The Jewish National Fund controls public land in Israel. And as even the State Department recognizes in its annual report on human rights practices, the JNF for short, is an essentially discriminatory body, which says in its charter that the land of Israel is not for the benefit of its citizens, but for the benefit of the Jewish people, whether they live there or not. So if you are a Palestinian citizen of Israel, and let's say you live in a city like Nazareth, and perhaps your family can even trace their lineage in Nazareth back to the time of Jesus, two millennia before the establishment of the State of Israel, you cannot rent land from the state because the JNF considers you to be the wrong religion.
the wrong nationality. This is just one of many types of institutional and societal discriminations that Palestinian citizens of Israel face. Now, I mentioned in 1948, Israel established its sovereignty over the ruins of Palestinian society on 78% of historic Palestine. In 1967, it conquered the remaining 22% and now exercises 100% control over 100% of historic Palestine. The very first military order that Israel promulgated in 1967 upon occupying these territories known as the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip was known as Military Order Number 101. Military Order 101 stripped Palestinians of all their political rights and remains in force today. So some of the things that are, quote, illegal for Palestinians living under Israeli military occupation are the following. One, it's illegal to wave a Palestinian flag. It's illegal for Palestinians to write something in the Palestinian media that Israel considers critical of its regime. It's illegal for Palestinians to join a political party. They're all illegal under Israeli military law. And it's illegal for Palestinians to gather in groups of 10 or more people for any political purpose whatsoever. So what we're doing here this evening in Ashfield, Massachusetts would be illegal according to the Israeli military, if we were having this conversation in a place like Bethlehem or East Jerusalem. And Israeli troops could come in, raid the event, arrest us, haul us off to jail, and hold us under what's known as administrative detention. Think of this as Guantanamo East. Mm -hmm. This is holding people without charge or trial, and definitely the United States did not make this practice up. Britain, used administrative detention extensively throughout its empire uh, pre-World War II. Now, none of these draconian laws, and of course, none of the systematic human rights abuses that Palestinians face under Israeli military occupation, <coughs> such as the injuring and killing of civilians, in the case of injuries, tens of thousands, in the case of killings, thousands, over the last decade and a half. The uprooting of Palestinian agriculture, the destruction of the Palestinian economy, the expropriation of Palestinian land, none of these systematic human rights abuses that Palestinians face living under Israeli military occupation apply to those Israeli Jews who have gone with the encouragement of their government to colonize this Palestinian land. They're given incentives to do so, tax breaks. And in fact, the discrimination that exists between the populations in the occupied Palestinian territories of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza Strip is so blatant that there's actually a two-tiered system for license plates. Palestinians have one color license plates. Israeli Jews have another. And Israel has actually built infrastructure in occupied Palestinian territory that is off limits for Palestinians to use. Not even in apartheid South Africa, where black South Africans banned from using specific roads. 
whether the Rolling Stones have been political uh, in the past, I don't recall them uh, being so. Uh, we've certainly seen that we've had more success uh, in targeting performers who are more politically conscious and aware. I mean, there's some performers that we don't even go after because we know we don't stand a chance of winning because we know that they don't care about politics or morality, they just are making money. So we did not run a campaign uh, against Rihanna uh, when she went to perform uh, in Israel last summer, I believe, because we didn't find any uh, track record of her having any type of social awareness. But when Alicia Keys went to perform, we did target her because she has done good work uh, to combat AIDS, uh, HIV. So we thought that we had a shot getting to her, unfortunately we did not win that case. So we'll see what happens with, uh, with the Rolling Stones. Uh, the question of whether all Israeli uh, products should be boycotted uh, or there should be targeted uh, campaigns is one, I think, that is of uh, local nature to decide what works best. Uh, there's lots of different contexts for these campaigns. There's lots of potential different targets, different strategies are gonna work uh, better in some communities and different approaches are gonna work better in others. So, you know, it really, it really depends. The Palestinian civil society call is for blanket campaigns of boycott, uh, divestment, and sanctions because, you know, first of all, the reality is that all Israeli businesses are profiting from Israel's oppression of Palestinian people, whether they're located in the occupied Palestinian territories or not. And you know, to try to separate Israel's economy into uh, economic activity that takes place in Israel proper or in the occupied Palestinian territories is an impossibility because this is not the way that Israeli businesses operate. Israeli businesses operate across these non-existent borders. Uh, there has been really a seamless integration of these occupied Palestinian territories into the Israeli economic infrastructure. So that's why a Dutch pension fund recently, I believe it was Dutch, divested from major Israeli banks. And these Israeli banks said, hey, why are you divesting from us? We don't have anything to do with Israeli military occupation. Well, guess what? When some of your branches are providing mortgages for settlements, you're complicit. Uh, whether or not your headquarters is in Tel Aviv or in Hebron, it doesn't matter. So the call from Palestinian civil society is for blanket uh, campaigns, but obviously we're all uh, human beings that only have 24 hours to a day, and we have other things we need to do in our lives, like work and eat and sleep and so forth. And there's a limited amount that anyone can do. So maybe a more targeted focused campaign against one corporation is what would make sense for your community. I can't answer that um, on anyone's behalf. 